Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, the Ramalinga Swami Center on Equity and Social Determinants of Health uh, is proud to launch the colloquium series on equity and social determinants of health. Uh, the center has been recognized as a center of excellence at the Public Health Foundation of India. And over the years, it has become a go-to place for training, research, and knowledge translation on gender and intersectionality in health systems and policy. This colloquium series is part of the center's larger objective of expanding opportunities to foster conversations around health inequities, particularly those relating to gender and its intersections with other sources of structural inequality. Our plan is to include uh, speakers from a mix of research, policy, uh, advocacy, and practice. And we would also like the talks to cover a range of health concerns, uh, sexual and reproductive uh, health, nutrition, uh, maternal and adolescent health and the like, and multiple axes of disadvantage, including gender, caste, class, and so on. I'm Srilata Rao Sishadri, uh, the director of the center. Our speaker today is Professor Rita Sen, uh, and she's going to be talking about inequality as a social determinant of health. The Ramalinga Swami Center has been privileged to have Professor Sen as our director, and we continue to have the benefit of her presence as our senior advisor, guide, and mentor. While she requires no introduction, nonetheless, uh, let me say a few words. Uh, Professor Sen uh, is trained as an economist with a PhD from Stanford University and a master's from the Delhi uh, School of Economics in New Delhi. She also has honorary degrees from doctorates from the universities of East Anglia, Sussex and Edinburgh and the Open University UK and Karolinska Institute in Sweden. She uh, is a distinguished professor at the Ramalinga Swami Center. After long teaching stints at uh, institutes like uh, IIM Bangalore, um, uh, Center for De uh, Development Studies in Trivandrum, Vassar College, and also an adjunct professor at the Harvard School of Public Health. She has championed the cause of gender inequality through DAWN, which is the development alternative for women for the new era, a network of women scholars, researchers, and activists from the global south. And she is best known for her path-breaking contributions to demography, gender and health equity, especially intersectionality, sexual and reproductive health and rights, and universal health coverage. She has many feathers to her cap, appointments at national and international policy making committees and panels, the list is too long to name here, commemorative lectures and keynote addresses, and a mile long list of publications, all packed into a, an extremely illustrious career. Uh, her talk, will be followed by a Q&A session. Please put your questions in the chat box as well, and we will take them in sequence, time permitting. Thank you so much for being with us today, Geeta, and now I leave the floor open to you. Thanks very much, uh, Srilata, and uh, uh, really it's a um, thank you to the Ramalinga Swami Center for inviting me to uh, open this colloquium series. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, I am um, I'm going to try and make this as lively as possible, paying full attention to the fact that it is the afternoon. Um, and so people are winding down from their days um, from their day's work. Let me um, let me start off with a reminiscence. I remember the decision to bring um, the E, that is for equity, in to complement um, SDH, social determinants of health, in the center's title, RCESDH, Ramalinga Swami Center on Equity and Social Determinants of Health, um, when uh, uh, the team and I um, sort of joined to get the center moving a few years 
um, a go. Um, and the decision to bring equity in specifically, rather than having it sort of embedded within social determinants of health, was because we felt that inequality and inequity otherwise often tended to get lost. Um, because although SDH, and I'm just going to call it SDH for uh, simplicity, social determinants of health, is defined by WHO and others to go beyond biomedical to broader economic and social causes and drivers of people's health, those broader causes are sometimes understood too narrowly. For example, we can't just include issues such as potable water, oh, sanitation, early childhood nutrition, all of which are, of course, crucially important social determinants, but they're not sufficient to understand what shapes our health unless we go deeper to understand the causes of inequality and inequity. And coming from a lifetime, uh, also it feels, of working on economic and social inequality, causes and consequences, that approach seemed has always seemed overly narrow to me. The setting up of the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health in the mid 2000s, with strong support from the then Director General, Lee Jong Wook, appeared to be a potential game changer in this scenario. And it felt like it could also reverse the limiting and narrowing of the global commitment to primary health care in the intervening years since Alma Mater. Michael Marmot headed the, commission, the WHO Commission, bringing his own experiences as a pioneer in focusing on equity and health through the Whitehall studies which mainly focused on occupational inequality. But, but in that focus, they all, a very important finding was that there are gradients rather than just threshold effects of inequality on health. That is, for instance, if you take, took his occupational categories, it wasn't just that at some point the inequality stopped right across from top to bottom or bottom to top, um, there, was, um, there, was, uh, there were inequality effects on health. The commission had a wide range of commissioners and also set up a range of knowledge networks on a number of subjects, including such things as typically don't get or didn't at that time get considered part of social determinants of health as globalization. Certainly early childhood development was there, but very importantly for our own work, women and gender equity uh, was, a, it was a major knowledge network for the commission and which I co-chaired along with my friend and colleague, Piroshka Ostlin. There were three main messages in the commission's report, which came out in 2008. One, improve daily living conditions of people, clean water, sanitation, um, um, adequate food and nutrition, um, jobs, all of these kinds of things that we generally tend to think of as part of social determinants of health, but they're part of very important parts of daily living conditions of people that have a big impact on health. Secondly, tackle the inequitable distribution of power, money, and resources. And this meant, among other things, ensure accountability of the private sector, support people's collective action, and promote global governance dedicated to equity. This was unusual, and this was an important um, ask that the commission brought forward. Tackle this inequitable dis distribution of power, money, and resources. And third, the measurement 
understanding analysis and assessing the impact of action. The Commission produced a substantial body of reports, publications, advocacy, and received significant support from public health, academic, and civil society communities. But Dr. Lee's untimely death, just two years into his DG ship, was a major blow, from which I might say the potential of the Commission actually um, as a major thrust area for WHO remained um, somewhat stunted as a result of that. Supporters of social determinants of health, therefore, have had to bide our time. And we've done that by focusing on deepening the evidence base, especially towards a wider focus on equity and equality, strengthening local and national, and I might say regional and global as well, action towards addressing social determinants. And last but not least, coping with, you might say, struggling against the increasing transformation of the global public health agenda towards more or less verticalization as well as significant increases in the power and role of private money and corporate interests. The questions to which I will attempt to return towards the end of the talk, if I have time or someone can ask me at that point, are all linked and they're all linked to inequality and inequity are one, are COVID-19, and or the apparent commitment to decolonizing health, potential opportunities to regain momentum for addressing social determinants of health. Secondly, how serious is the threat of anti-gender ideology, which appears to be sweeping across a number of countries through its connections to right-wing, authoritarian populism. And one only needs to think about the United States, Italy, Hungary, Poland, Iran, of course, right now in the thick of it at the moment, but also Russia and a number of other countries. And thirdly, how are we to understand the public health implications of the contradictory movements on abortion? On the one hand, you have a green wave pro safe abortion sweeping across a number of countries in Latin America, Ireland, and other places, versus, of course, the infamous Roe v. Wade decision taken by recently by the US Supreme Court. These are all questions, these three questions on COVID 19 on the anti-gender ideologies and populism and the public health implications of what is happening on abortion. All of these, in fact, I, will, I would argue are linked to inequality and inequity, but I won't get into them in the, in the um, core of my presentation today. So let me move quickly then to what I consider is important for us to look at, which is what is the nature of the evidence base on equity and equality in health? I ask this question this because for many people, why should inequality be the issue? Shouldn't we simply be looking just at the levels of poverty um, that, why should inequality matter and in itself have implications for health? Once one, a country graduates out of poverty or once a group or a community within a country graduates above the poverty level, haven't we got, aren't we well on the way to resolving the health problem? And obviously from the title of my talk, I don't believe we are. Yes, some certain problems, yes, but a number of others pop up as well. And it's therefore important for us to understand what these manifestations of health inequality are and 
then look at what we know by way of evidence in terms of their effects. So first, the manifestations of health inequality are straight back. Three manifestations of health inequality. The first, health outcomes in the sense that we usually understand them. Secondly, differential vulnerability and risks due to social determinants of health. And thirdly, inequality in access and affordability of preventive, promotive, curative, and restorative health services. There are three manifestations of health inequality that will be popping up in our discussions of the evidence. So broadening and deepening the evidence base involves broadening and deepening the evidence base on inequality and intersectionality. Theories, methodologies, qualitative and quantitative data analysis. Secondly, on inequality, inequity, and their connections to human rights, mainly through what is called AAAQ, that is access, affordability, accountability, and quality. How do inequality and intersectionality affect AAAQ? And third, on policies, programs, laws, and institutions. The Ramalinga Swami Center, of course, as you've seen in that brief presentation, works and has worked on each of the above, uh, particularly on the quality aspects through our work on disrespect and abuse and respectful maternity care. Um, and of course, as um, Srilath has said in the presentation, our work on women's health and well-being and the collaborations with um, the UN University's um, Institute on Policies and Programs. Let's take an India perspective. I think the India perspective is this. Why, 75 years after independence, is our health system so weak? We usually tend to think about it in terms of inadequate financing, insufficient resources of human resources, uh, infrastructure, and so on, all of which are true. But is it also possible that there are deeper underpinnings in inequality and inequity that, in fact, make it difficult or militate against our adequately resourcing? our health system. Why are our health outcomes so poor? And why is health status so unequal and so abysmal at the lower ends? I'm not denying the advances made during NRHM in particular, but we have no real good answers to da data such as this. One third of children under five are moderately or severely stunted. And that's about 40 million children who are stunted, about 25 million children who are wasted. And that's nearly 50% in Bihar and UP. Um, and even in states like Kerala and Goa, it's about 20%. When we get to the poorest wealth quintile, again, it's about 50% of the kids in that poorest wealth quintile are moderately or severely stunted. And that's twice, they're twice as likely in that quintile to be stunted as the highest quintile. And when it comes to wasting, they are five times as likely to be wasted. Uh, same is true when, they are, when their mothers have no education. And it, that number is, over 40% among Dalits and Adivasis. It's very clear when we look at these, or we can pick up any other set of numbers, and we'll find that our, what I call, original sins of caste and gender inequalities and injustices, as well as others such as disability, are at play. 
These are the fundamental social determinants of health at work here. Now, in a lecture I gave, the Yusuf Hamid lecture that I gave at the Mailman School in 2020, a couple of years ago, called Is Inequality Toxic for Public Health Agendas? I identified five evidence clusters. Those are the following. The first cluster focuses on income and wealth inequalities. There is by now a large body of evidence in both high income countries and low and middle income countries on health impacts. And this work from Michael Marmot's work onwards has emphasized and focused on gradients as well as that it's not the absolute level. And of course, many of you probably know the work of Wilkinson and Pickett, the spirit level, and then the followed, following work on mental health, the inner level, on um, the role of inequality in health outcomes in uh, high-income countries. In India, from 1961 to 2020, the wealth share of the bottom 50%. And this is all, you know, this is very good, very recent uh, putting together of data. Wealth share of the bottom 50% fell from around 12% to just about 6% of the total, while the top 10% rose from 43% to 64%. The top 1% went from around 12% in 1961 to 32%. 1% of our population owns 32% of the wealth in the country. And the top 10% own 64% of the wealth in the country. This is especially true in the era since liberalization. It has been inequality has gotten much worse since 1991. The critical questions that this raises, given the very large body of evidence that exists on the relationship between income and wealth inequalities and health, are what do these increases mean for health outcomes in the country? There are corresponding but somewhat lesser increases in the inequality in income and consumption in India, which I won't get into, but there too, there have been significant increases in inequality. What does this mean in terms of vulnerability and exposure to ill health causing factors? And what, if anything, does it mean for access and affordability of health services? Or are programs to improve AAA Q, access, affordability, access, um, uh, accountability, and quality, functioning like the proverbial mop to the flood released by the inequality taps that are wide open in the country. And I think this is the problem that the welcome and income and wealth inequality data, um, these are the questions that it um, that that data drives us towards. A second cluster is social inequalities. And here is where um, the center itself has done a huge amount of work. Group, when we say social inequalities, we are referring largely to group-based inequalities, whether those groups are about gender, caste, race and ethnicity, religion, disability, migrant status, refugee status, geography, rural versus urban, or sexual orientation or gender identity. Many of these group social inequalities are actually a product of a society's original sins. As I said, I believe the two fundamental original sins in our country are gender and caste, but we are now adding more to that, which are not original, but which are likely to become so um, if we carry on um, in this, uh, in the divisive directions 
where the country is going. These original sins are persistent, hardy perennials that are extremely slow to change. They result in a range of phenomena that affect health. Discrimination, exclusion from services, othering, stigma, explicit and implicit biases of different kinds, as well as physical, mental, and sexual abuse, and the fear of violence, as well as actual violence. The effects on health, therefore, as you can see, are somewhat different from those that result from wealth and income inequalities, although there's a lot of overlapping in the effects. The consequences include the non-recognition of the health problems of groups that are at the bottom or at the lower end of social hierarchies, as well as exclusion and discrimination. The deep presence then of social inequalities and their intersectionality with each other and with economic inequalities is part of this second cluster of evidence. And how does intersectionality enter the picture? Intersectionality, in a sense, is sometimes too lightly used in, um, in uh, uh, advocacy. But in fact, if we probe the meaning of intersectionality um, more carefully, we find that it actually opens up a range of interesting and important questions. Not all poor people have the same health outcomes. For example, poor men versus poor women. And we found that in our own work. An intersectional lens raises a plethora of new questions and concepts. And I will happily refer you to the center's work in this area and also the work of many others, including, for instance, Arlene Geronimus in the United States, who many, many decades ago um, introduced the concept of weathering to, um, to ask and address this question. We all know that teen, pre teen pregnancy, this is an accepted fact, right, quote unquote. Teenage pregnancy is a bad thing. It's a bad thing for the health of the woman because she's too young, not prepared for childbearing. And yet, when it came to African-American women, Geronimus argued that, in fact, teenage was probably the healthiest age at which African-American women could bear children. Because as they graduated out of the teen years, the kinds of stressors on their lives made them actually less and less healthy in terms of childbearing. A fascinating and eye-opening concept, the idea of weathering. Also such ideas as, have, um, as are present in our own work, rationing within households. If there are only limited resources in a poor household, to whom do they go? Or leveraging, how do groups leverage and use advantages that they may have along one dimension of inequality, say gender or caste, to compensate for or make up for um, disadvantages in another area, say economics? And these are some of the kinds of questions and concepts that intersectionality have raised, in addition to new methods of quantitative and qualitative data analysis, as well as new policy challenges, um, which I won't get into here. So social inequalities has opened up and really become an expanded and deeply interesting area of evidence. Uh, on inequalities and their relationship to health. The third cluster uh, is of status 
inequalities. And this is largely comes in the work of social epidemiologists. The imbalances between life challenges and capabilities, for instance, can you find a partner? Can you start a family? Do you have a steady source of income, et cetera, et cetera? What the wear and tear of unfulfilled aspirations among those at the lower end of inequalities relative to others. It's not the level per se, it's the inequality relative to others. Generates chronic stress, frustration, anger, and anxiety. And it manifests in many forms that affect population health, including joining a millenarian group like QAnon in the US or othering, blaming others for your own situation or feeling superior to somebody else and a range of ways in which social factors can end up affecting population health. And we only need to look at the global experience during the pandemic, COVID-19, to see many of these that have been at work and continue to be at work. The fourth cluster of evidence is the psychoneuroendocrinological processes, which has their roots in psychosomatic medicine and the concept of allostatic load that it has been developed here. Chronic stress of the kind that many people who are at the bottom, at the receiving end of inequalities and inequities face and deal with chronic levels of stress. But chronic stress alters the regulation mechanisms of the endocrine system. And in altering the way in which the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland and the adrenal gland pathways work together, it can lead to hypocortisolism in the system, which then has an impact on nerve endings that stimulate serotonin, which is the happiness hormone. So early adver adverse events in people's lives, separation in childhood, sexual abuse, chronic oppression, such as what women or Dalits or African-Americans or people living with disabilities might face, can result in triggering these kinds of pathways and they result in adverse behaviors such as smoking, substance abuse, dietary problems, which then have major implications for health. And this is a rich and growing body of evidence about the effects of inequality. And last but by no means least, the fifth cluster, the epigenetic factors, changes that are due not to changes in the genetic code itself, but changes in the way in which genes are expressed. Poor diet, undernutrition, living and working in toxic environments, stressed lifestyles, or stressors coming from the workplace can all lead not just to ill health through direct exposures, but that is there, but also through epigenetics affect the child in the womb, but also have trans can have transgenerational effects by affecting the oocytes in the fetal ovaries themselves. So that the, the female fetus, the oocytes in the female fetus's ovaries pick up the effects of epigenetics and these stresses. Emerging research tells us that the effects can thereby go across multiple generations. So whether or not improving the nutritional status of girls today results in big improvements in health for girls, epigenetics may mean that in fact, you end up with more diabetes tomorrow caused by insulin resistance due to fetal undernutrition. But epigenetics also means that the effects are carried, can be carried across multiple generations. Risks for diabetes, cancers, cognitive disorders, infertility, all of these can be transmitted in this way. 
what does this rich and growing body of evidence, um, how might we conclude to pull this together? First, inequality casts a very long shadow within societies and over time on the health and well being of people. Secondly, economic inequality is only the tip of the iceberg, although it's a mountain sized tip, I admit, but I insist that it is only the tip of the iceberg. Third, social inequality, including intersectionality, can sometimes contradict what economic inequality may be telling us, as for example, in the weathering hypothesis. But quite often, of course, they, the two overlap and synergize in a bad way with each other. Fourth, status inequality helps us understand individual and group behaviors, including health-related beh behaviors, such as the problems we've seen during COVID-19, opposition to masks, the phenomenon of blaming those who are trying to control the pandemic, and so on. Fifth, psychoneuroendocrinology is advancing our understanding of chronic problems that are unequally present in society. And finally, reproductive epigenetics has moved us beyond direct exposures to stressors towards understanding inter and transgenerational effects of inequality. I've sort of had to give you a capsule version, which is in some senses you can think of as a kind of framework for thinking about the ways in which inequality, different kinds of inequality, actually can affect both physical and mental, um, mental um, health. But the question is, what through which through what pathways does inequality affect health inequalities and a young colleague who's recently joined our center asked me this question today with a little bit of frustration she said how do i distinguish between using the terminology of disparities and differences versus using the terminology and language of inequalities. And I hope I gave her the right answer. I said, disparities and differences may be, quote unquote, innocent. Inequalities imply relationships of superior and inferior along whatever dimension it may be. Those who are above do not simply exist in innocent juxtaposition to those who are below. They can affect their wealth, their health, their well being, their status, their opportunities, their actions, their beliefs, and societal norms. In a word, they have power over them. The um, literature on power and its implications in health have also been growing. And our center also has been making some contributions towards that. And I think it's one of the most exciting areas that link inequality to health. The how power works is critical for us to understand the pathway that leads from inequality to health. Just as those above are not innocent, those below also may react in different ways to inequality. They may internalize it. And as many women do when they find that they have no way out of their unequal gender situation, they internalize and become and suffer from long-standing depression. Or they may resist 
but opening or, or subvert, opening up or rebel, opening up the possibility of violence and threats of violence of the type that, uh, that the young women in Iran are facing on the streets um, today. There are risks to each of these approaches in terms of health directly, but also in terms of violence and fear of violence. And yet, as human beings, we continue to do these things. We don't just internalize. We also resist, we subvert, we rebel, we find ways of dealing with the power pathways of inequality. The burgeoning evidence tells us that inequality also generates particular norms and behaviors towards others and oneself that affect health. Toxic masculinity, hyperaggressive, depression on the other side, physical and mental health problems, in addition to the standard health measures of illness or wellness. But inequality also affects the context of laws, policies, institutions, finance, through the pathway of greater or lesser solidarity among groups. Greater inequality has been found in society after society, often means lower solidarity, less interest in, by those who are better off in those who are worse off non-recognition of the challenges and problems of those who are worse off, and unwillingness to support or finance programs and policies, blaming the victims. All of these are ways in which inequality erodes solidarity. One then has to ask what might be happening in a society where wealth and income inequalities have so drastically changed in the last 60 years and particularly in the last 30 years or so, since about 1991. Are we missing, as I said, are we trying to address mop the floor when the inequality taps of society are wide open and generating health problems in through a variety of different ways, including lower solidarity. You remember I asked the question, I said, we might have an answer to why it is that we never seem to be able to get above that horrible 1% of GDP that our health budget um, uh, is allocated to. Could that be because of an absence of solidarity? Could it be because solidarity is getting worse in addition to everything else that is going on? The inimical effects of inequality on a society's level of solidarity are probably the deepest and most wide ranging of its effects. And I would argue one of the biggest challenges to people's health. Thanks very much for your patience in listening to me. And I look forward to answering your questions.